All right, you guys, this is Ross, the Fig Boss. We're doing another fig variety review today because I've just been so thoroughly impressed with this particular variety. I've been, I'm not going to cover every single variety that I grow this year as I do every year. I really try to point out the standouts, make sure that you guys are aware of what a really great fig is for different reasons. We can learn from different trees and we talk about the differences between them and how we're learning all these different techniques and skills and gaining knowledge from growing different varieties. If that's something you want to do is learn about a particular fruit or particular vegetable, grow a wide variety of vegetables or grow a wide variety of the varieties, excuse me, and also grow them in different ways. You know, grow them in containers, grow them in the ground, grow them in, in just any way you can think of. You're going to learn something new about that particular variety, hands down. And this one, for me, I really didn't like it. Uh, it's called Little Ruby, by the way, for anyone that's interested. And we did a blog post on this particular fruit. I wrote up a whole article on it on my blog, figboss.com. I'll put that link in the description of this video for those of you guys who wanna check it out and read about all kinds of different fig-related information. But this particular fig, I really, as I said in that blog post, I really just didn't like it for many years. In fact, usually when I don't like a particular fig, I get rid of it and it's gone. And I have no emotions, I have no feelings towards these fruits or these figs. I try to be as unbiased as possible to make accurate decisions I can and, and give you guys detailed analysis so that I'm not really persuaded one way or the other. I try to be open-minded to all possibilities in life in general. And I'm the same way with these, these fig varieties. And the only reason really I kept it was because I thought that it would make a great rootstock. This tree actually has been in this location here for three years. You can tell this butterfly bush is really overcrowding it. So it's been in a shadier spot for its three years. Um, although I've really been training it outwards this way and outwards this way and keeping this butterfly bush pruned back a bit to give it the, the light that it needs. But for the most part, it's not really because of the light or the lack of light that it is so small. It just naturally won't get that very big. It is a dwarf variety. And I thought it would be crazy to even say that, to, and for anyone even to claim that, because how could a fig variety be dwarf? They all grow so quickly. <laughs> you know, if you had this tree in the ground here for 10 years, I wonder really how big it would be. A lot of the nursery catalogs claim it doesn't really get over six feet tall, which is great for a homeowner to have a tree that only is about six by six. You could very easily net it. I think that's perfect for most people. Kids love it at that height. Uh, it's easier to maintain at that height. You don't need a ladder, but at least for me, I, I'm still not really of the opinion that if you had this tree in the ground for 10 years, it would certainly get over six by six. I mean, it's only been three years and the tree's already at probably four feet or so in height. And width-wise, it certainly expands a lot further out width-wise than it has height-wise. But, you know, I would definitely argue, however, it is certainly dwarf. And if you look at fig varieties just in general, it is a dwarf fig, and that is very easily depicted by one particular way that you can determine this, is actually the diameter of the wood. So if you look at the diameter of wood and you, you measure this on all of your fig varieties down here at the base, you compare the measurements of, let's say, this is Ron de Bordeaux, it has definitely average or a slightly above average vigor. If you compared that to Little Ruby here, Little Ruby has a very thin diameter to its wood, even after a few years of growth. If you measure that diameter, you compare them all. This one among all of my varieties would probably have the smallest diameter. There's a couple others, like Ronde Bordeaux, I'm sorry, not Ronde Bordeaux, Neruccio de Elba, and also um, probably a very dwarf strain or source of Pastelier. But it's definitely in the bottom three, and without a doubt, uh, because it is so dwarf, I thought 
I should keep it because I think in the future someday it would make a great rootstock. And that maybe it's better to have a dwarfing rootstock, maybe it's better to have a vigorous rootstock. And I was playing with that idea of each one to really determine what the deal is, you know, really wrap my head around those thoughts. Um, and I came to the conclusion that it's better to have a vigorous rootstock, especially if you're growing them in containers. If you want a larger tree, you want a more productive tree. Um, overall, I think you're just gonna get more fruit. You're gonna have an easier time growing it on these larger rootstocks. And I've seen that across the board with every fruit tree. It's not just figs, it's also with stone fruits and apples and pears. I much personally much prefer the standard sized rootstocks that that you can grow and have access to. So I've even considered ripping out some of my dwarf trees and planting in a standard and just grafting different varieties to the standard. So I feel the same way about, about figs, but this tree has been so impressive now over the years, these last three years in the ground, that it really has come into its own. And even though it is dwarf and maybe a bit more difficult to establish in a container, over time, it really does well, I think, in the ground and has no problem whatsoever, um, I think, as a rootstock, a dwarfing rootstock for somebody who is trying to grow a smaller tree, doesn't have a big area of land, um, doesn't want to maintain a lot of the tree. This is a great option. And um, I also believe that it's extremely hardy as well. And that's really what is written about this fig in nursery catalogs, is that it was found by a guy, a guy named Denny McGawkey. I think that's how you, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Sorry, Denny. He's a biologist. I think he's retired now and he was breeding some figs. He, he found Olympian, which Olympian, in my opinion, is just an English brown turkey. But this one apparently is a seedling and I had no idea. I thought this was a another find that he had found this fruit somewhere and uh, he named it Little Ruby. And, you know, at least to me in my eyes is that this Little Ruby fig has always reminded me so significantly of Hardy Chicago, but it just in some ways seems so inferior. It was a dwarf, the fruits are smaller, the, the eye is slightly open, the shape of the fruits is wrong. You know, it's not as split resistant. Uh, it just has these inferior qualities to it that Hardy Chicago clearly doesn't have. Um, so for all those reasons, I thought, well, you know, again, like I said, I wasn't really that into it. This year, again, it's finally matured. And now I'm seeing, again, more of that resemblance to Hardy Chicago I think even the leaves look similar, the fruits look similar, the fruits taste similar, the hardiness is similar. Everything about this seems so similar that I would bet any amount of money, it seems like to me, that there's hardy Chicago in the parentage that Denny had used to breed this fig. Now, if that's not the case, then that would be interesting as well because then it kind of leads you to the point where well, no wonder there's so many hardy Chicago types out there because if you just breed certain figs together, the chances of you getting a fig like hardy Chicago seemingly is somewhat high. And I've always sort of thought about that as well in that, you know, I always thought the hardy Chicago types were mutations of each other and slight variations based on where they have grown for many years. But I've always also noticed that when you breed figs and there's figs that are seedlings, they tend to be of a similar type of fig very consistently. A lot of them end up looking a lot like Canadria, as an example, or Atriano. They just seem to look similar. I don't know if that's because of the parentage or the capper fig that they use or what, but it's interesting. You know, it's just, a, a, you know, my thoughts, it's a nice thought experiment. And, you know, I still, again, as I think this is related to Hardy Chicago, I just don't know. I've never talked to Denny about this fig or talked to him at all. So I don't know what the parentage is. I don't know what the, I guess you could find it in the, in the, in the patent, I guess, right? This fig I think is probably patented, right? If he bred it, 
and then sold it off to nurseries. I imagine it's under patent, but I don't know. I really don't know that either. So but the point is, is that I've always thought that this was related to Hardy Chicago, and now it makes even more sense because there's a good chance that it is a seedling of Hardy Chicago, and therefore it is quite hardy. So if you combine the dwarf characteristics, you combine the hardiness, and the hardiness I've seen here firsthand for the last two seasons, this is quite a hardy fig. Uh, very minimal damage that this variety will take in the wintertime. And I haven't seen, I think, zero degrees yet with this particular fig, but it does well. And I would argue that if you were gonna try any rootstock and you were gonna grow it out for a home gardener, you were gonna graft a particular variety onto it and sell that off to people, this would be a really great choice uh, to start for people even in like a warmer zone seven, definitely zone eights, this is going to make a great rootstock for people in those particular locations that want something a bit smaller. So I've been, and you know what, I've also just been very impressed with it in general this year because the fruits have been about double the size. They're tastier. Um, before they were so small and so inferior to Hardy Chicago that I just didn't even bother with it. Like I would see the fruits ripen and I would just say, eh, whatever but after now it's really got itself well adapted and really well dug in here in the ground it's totally changed it's like a totally different fig it produced about 10 braba this year and then starting around may august 1st excuse me the main crop started which is incredible um so for the last two weeks i've been enjoying main crop off of this tree i've probably in total today's august 15th I've probably in total enjoyed off of this very small productive tree, I have enjoyed about 25, 30 ish figs off of this in total. And that's pretty impressive. I'm really happy with that because it's, it's only August 15th. You know, usually a lot of my figs come in in September, but this one's just been so impressive. And again, the vigor is low, but the productivity is high. You know, the node spacing is quite tight, and you just get a lot of fruits in a very small space and it's extremely early. So that has been very impressive as well is that this fig ripened 65 days after the fruits were visible on the tree, which is insane. 65 days, that's unheard of. Most varieties guys will ripen 70 to 90 to 120 days later. This one's even earlier than that, 65. The fruits had shown up on the tree on their own, no pinching. June 1st, that's the main crop. And then by August 1st, around August 1st, I think it might've been around a little bit like August 3rd or something. Roughly that's about 65 days. So that's incredible. It really is. So this is an extremely early variety. It produces Braba. What this means to me is that this is a great variety for anyone in the Pacific Northwest. You're probably gonna enjoy the Braba. And then right after that, you're gonna enjoy the main crop. Um, and even here in the, in, you know, the Northeast, this is a great alternative to a hardy Chicago. Um, I still think there are hardy Chicago types that are tastier and better than this, but it's hard to beat guys. I mean, for all those reasons, you like hardy Chicago, you're going to like this fruit. Um, as long as it survives the winter time, it's going to produce a ton of fruits for you at a very, very early date earlier than Hardy Chicago um, and you're going to be impressed with it. So let me actually, there's a cicada in there going nuts. But let me actually get some of these fruits for you guys. I have some that are basically dried up on the, on the tree. <laughs> this fruit dries easily. It, uh, it has a short hang time. It's just in general fantastic. This cicada unfortunately is stuck such a weird bug. I don't know if I've really seen many of them in person like this before. But these dry well, as I said, the, the, the hang time short, you're only really looking at maybe, I don't know, a uh, about a six day hang time, which is I think slightly below average to get a dried fruit. That's pretty darn good to get them shriveling like this. And what I really like about the fruits now 
is that when they're shriveling like this, they are so figgy, so flavorful. Uh, I picked three here at different stages of ripeness to really show you guys what I'm dealing with. But the one in the back left is shriveled. The one in the front is a lot less ripe. And I wanna cut these open for you guys. Taste the fruit, we'll finish this, this review. Hopefully my camera doesn't shut off because we're running out of battery right now. I'm gonna bring you guys over here to my knife. And we're gonna open these up. All right, zoom in. I'm gonna cut all these open really quickly for you guys. The one downside about this fruit, and I wanna mention this because it's not like there's no negatives. The eye is open. When the eye is open like this, it's not good. And usually the eye is pointing towards the sky. So it can split for sure. And the ants love it. And if there is any rain or excess moisture in the air, the interior is exposed and it does produce mold and can spoil a little bit right at the eye. So it's not perfect. This is far from perfect in terms of fruit quality. But guess what? I love it. The amount of fruits it produces this early in the season, you can mostly avoid a lot of that spoilage and fermentation you might see later in the season, the insects you might see later in the season. And it's just so darn tasty that I would argue it doesn't really matter to me. It's not gonna take the best spot but they're very good. And you know, they look just like Hardy Chicago, guys. This one's got a little bit of ant, ants in there. But look at how good that looks right there. Whoo! That's amazing. Look at that fruit. Glistening, just like a really well-ripened Hardy Chicago. Dark pulp. But what I really like about this, because these these... These less ripe ones taste like Hardy Chicago with some good figginess to them. Noticeable, strong figginess to them. Here's the second most ripe one. It's very, very good. It's like eating a strawberry and a fig and the figginess is really strong. It's like a dried fruit plus a strawberry. It's so good. And then if I eat this really dried one, the shriveled one here, The figginess is out of this world. The pulp is very jammy, very thick, very sticky. Lasts on your tongue. Great, great flavor. So for me, I think actually, I originally was rating this at a 4.0, four out of five. I think this is probably like a four, four. It's so good. Um, and the figginess is something I don't normally get too much exposure to with a lot of my varieties. So when I say the flavor is similar to Hardy Chicago, it is. Like you wouldn't know necessarily that you weren't eating a Hardy Chicago if you were blindfolded, but because it's so figgy, it's so different in a sense than Hardy Chicago that I think brings it to another level. I think brings it to another level. I think this is a really high quality piece of fruit it's amazing that the ants just crawl in here and then they die. They just get stuck in the pulp or they just eat themselves to death. I don't know what it is. 